I sat there, I get fired up. Look here, you don't have to. I know, I know sometimes we, I know sometimes we like to be, you know, we like excellence because we believe in excellence. But sometimes, you know what we need to do? Thank you for that. Thank you, Brother Chris. My God, I, th- I was about to slap that thing. You know what I'd have done? I'd have slapped it and it'd come right around and hit me right in the mouth. Because it had a swinging arm on it. You see it? I thought about just hitting it like that. I thought, hey, it'd come around and smack me. <laughs> and I probably got the worst <laughs> the deal. <laughs> and then Hank would have been mad at me because that thing does not look cheap. So he might have been mad. He might have been an antique. I don't know. But he probably wouldn't have been happy about that one, would he? <laughs> oh, man. We out here in the storm, brother. We on 16 or 17. I don't even know how quick count that. Seven, just day 17. And I've got a word for the hour. I'm telling you, you're going to be glad you come to this house tonight. I promise you. We're going to get some meat of the word. We've been getting priests to and priests on and, and, and all that. But we're fixing to get into the meat of the word tonight. Amen. And get something. What God's been reminding me of here in the last day or two. There's a lot that He's been reminding me of, church, and, and speaking to me. You know, we know there's times of silence in your life, and when God goes silent, it doesn't mean you're necessarily in sin or backslid or any of those things. We say silent, maybe you're not hearing from the way that you did, maybe you're not, you know. And there's times that God did that and expects you to walk by faith and follow the last instruction that He has given. That's what faith is. It's obedience. Amen? But may His favor go before you, and beside you, and behind you, all around you. He said goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life. But I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 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 Amen. The devil hates the blessing. Hates it. Hates it. God's favor is on us. Why? Because of Jesus. It ain't because of me. I didn't pay the price. He did. I just received what He's offered me. <laughs> Come on, brother. Hey, ain't that, just, ain't that it? Uh, he took my place. He took your place last time I checked. I wasn't good enough. There wasn't nothing I could have done. Nothing you could have done. But I could receive what He was offering to me. And that was salvation. He was offering me a life. He was offering me a trade. My life for His. Mine wasn't no good. Yours wasn't either. Okay, how good your thoughts were. God said, I, I made sure that all became guilty. Why? So one man's obedience could make many righteous. The one man's obedience. The man, Christ Jesus. The man, Christ Jesus. Amen. And so we're made righteous today only in Him. Only in Him. He said He found in Him at His coming, didn't He? But we've been pressing for 17 days now and, and I'm not planning on stopping anytime soon. We're going to at least then. At least to July 5th. And we're going to obey God. Amen. I want to give you this message tonight. I want to talk to you, teach you a little bit. This is more of our church group than it is anybody else. And I want to call this Holy Spirit our God. Holy Spirit our God. I want you to go to John chapter number 16 and verse number 13. John chapter number 16, verse number 13. With God's help tonight and the help of the Holy Ghost, I will preach and teach this to you tonight. So I submit wholly to Him. 16 and verse 13. Remember, Holy Spirit, our God. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm fixing to have him. If you ain't got a neighbor to act like the one that's fixing to be there, say, look, it's fitting to happen. You hear me? It is fitting to happen. I'm serious. It's fitting to go down. It's fixing to go down, brother. Look here. they got a lot of people with a lot of gatherings that don't mean God's in it. I'm going to say that again. A lot of people with a lot of gatherings, but it doesn't mean God's in it. Amen. 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 I've seen rock singers could, could pack out coliseums. I know God can too. But I've seen rock singers pack out coliseums. That don't mean God's in it. That don't make, that don't mean a, that don't, they, they out there dancing and jumping and shouting and everything. And if you got into that, you'd feel good. You physically, you'd get into it. You'd jump, shout, and stuff like that. You'd feel good too. Spirit of God ain't in it. 
Amen? He's not dancing to ACDC. He's not, he, he's not, he's not singing too legit to quit. <laughs> now, if y'all know that song, you know, I know yeah, some of you are like, yeah. <laughs> you don't know, brother, I, I know some of you looking down like, I don't even know what that is. You do? Okay. Anyway, just throw that out. <laughs> okay. Here it is. John chapter 16, verse 13. How be it when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. I see somebody still one left. He will guide you into all truth. Amen. For He shall not speak of Himself, but whatsoever He shall hear, that shall He speak, and He will show you things to come. I want to read the Passion Translation. I'm a King James man, but I'm going to read the Passion Translation in this same context of what I'm talking about here, okay? In verse 13 of the Passion, he says this, the same verse, I'm just going to read it in the Passion. I study and I preach mostly out of King James, but I sometimes refer to others just to, just, just to get a... Amen. But when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, listen to this, He will unveil the reality of every truth within you. <clears throat> Let me say that again. Let me read that again. Hey, can everybody hear me? Everybody hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Now watch this. But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will unveil the reality of every truth within you. He won't speak on His own, but only what He hears from the Father, and He will reveal prophetically to you what is to come. Prophetically to you what is to come. That's prophetic. In verse 14, He will glorify Me on the earth, and He will receive from Me what is Mine and reveal it to you. Everything that belongs to the Father belongs to me. That's why I say that the divine encourager will receive what is mine and relay it to you. Soon you won't see me any longer, but then after a little while you will see me in, in a new way. And in a, in a new way. And in a new way. To me that would be in context, teach you for a moment, in context it would be, you know when they said this, they said we once knew after the resurrection they would talk about Jesus and they would say, we knew Him in the flesh and now we know Him by the Spirit. Now we know Him deeper. We knew Him, by, we knew him in the flesh, we walked with Him. I know that the Spirit of God was in it. What I'm saying is, but after the resurrection, when they truly was born of His Spirit, okay, truly new creations in Christ, and you say, well, they walked with Jesus. They did miracles. Yeah, He gave me authority. But nobody could be a new creation in Christ until Jesus was resurrected. He could. He was the firstborn among many brethren. How could you be resurrected if He hadn't been resurrected from the grave? That's why He said this. He said this. He said, you're going to, he said in, the, in the Passion Translation, soon you won't see me any longer, but then after a little while you will see me in a new way. You'll see me in my glorified state. You'll see me in my resurrected state. His resurrection was your resurrection and my resurrection. Right? Because He lives, you live. But if He didn't come back from the dead, then we are dead in our sins and there's no hope for us. But we know that ain't true because we got hope today, don't we? Amen? Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so, I want, to, I want to talk to you just, and I want you to hold this thought for a second. Holy Spirit is our guide. So He'll guide us into all truth. He'll teach us all things. Actually, He even said the Holy Spirit would bring to remembrance the things that He said to them. He told the, he told the disciples that. He said, look, He'll even bring to remembrance the things that I've taught you. That, that's why He said, go into the upper room and wait. Wait till you be endued with power from on the high. Wait till you receive the promise of the Father. Go and get in one accord and get ready. 
God's always taking us deeper and He's wanting us to go further with Him and deeper, but a lot of the church won't listen. We won't get out of ourselves and our comfort zone long enough to go deeper into Him and to the things that He's wanting to reveal to us and the places He's wanting to take us. If we're not careful in this time, we get caught up in self, we get caught up in our emotions, we get caught up in our feelings. Because by feeling, when I sat and I hit the bed today and I was fixing to come here, by feelings, I wasn't even came. If I would have went with the way out. Can I be transparent with you? I've been preaching for 17 days straight. I went to a meeting today and sat three hours and talked with some other apostles and church planners and, and, and sat in that meeting for three hours. Okay? So I could have I could have easily just fell over in my face and 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 said, you know what, that's the way I felt. But guess what? I don't go by the way I feel. Because there's something deeper on the inside of me that causes me to jump up and go when nothing else, when the flesh is saying lay down, when the mind's saying quit. Praise God. But there's something on the inside that starts to stir. And the Spirit of the living God starts to awaken something down on the inside of me and He becomes your strength in a time of weakness. He becomes that get up and go when you ain't got no go. He becomes that, amen. amen. He becomes that for you. He said the Holy Spirit, which is our God. Now I want you to keep this mindset as I get into this message and dig some meat out of the Word. Is that hard to hear? Okay. Is it too loud for anybody? No? Okay. I'm just checking on you guys. i got to check on you too as your pastor, right? Yeah. i got to make sure to see how your state is. Amen? Yeah. But I wouldn't push you nothing that, that I didn't know that God wasn't in and God wasn't leading us because He's got a greater plan. And He's trying to take us into a land flowing with milk and honey. And I don't know about you, but I'm not sitting back in the wilderness. <laughs> I'm going on. <laughs> you hear me? It's a better day. Amen. But I'm going to enjoy the one I'm in, and I'm going to enjoy this night, and I'm going to enjoy the Word and the meat of the Word. Tonight you're going to get something you're going to get with an evangelist. We're going to get something that's going to be some meat. We're going to see it. We're going to dig it out. We're going to go into Paul. We're going to go into the road to Damascus. We're going to go into, you know, when Jesus was baptized in the Holy Spirit. We know we had a relationship with God. He was, he was God's Son. He was God manifested in the flesh. God became a man. Welcome among us, right? Son of God. Son of man. Perfect. Never sinned. Last Adam. Born of a virgin. He has perfect relationship with His Father God. If you don't see the Trinity in that, look here. The, the God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Right there it is. We say Trinity. We use that word. But I don't even got to use the word Trinity. All I got to do is say, here it is. Okay? Here's God's Son, Jesus, manifested in the flesh. He's from the Father, born of the Father. Here's Holy Spirit that descends and God speaks over him and said, This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Holy Spirit descends on Jesus of Nazareth. And that was what empowered him to go about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Why? Because God hath anointed him. But what the Bible says, it says God anointed him. Jesus of Nazareth. who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. I want you to watch something here. I know we've got we, we, we get personal and we get we, sometimes we get we get we get selfish, but not really. We should be in our relationship with God and in and, and our walk with Him to a certain extent. You can't give and give and give and give and give and give and and, 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 and go out of the world or leave the planet yourself because you've entered yourself so much and you've never took time for yourself and your relationship with God. You never took time to have your prayer life because you're so busy pouring out for other people. Nothing wrong with helping people. But some people will drain you. Listen to me. There's some people that are doors. There's some people that are gates. There's some people that are sent by the devil to you. And there's some people that are sent by God to you. You better discern which ones they are. You better discern them pretty quick. Because the devil will send people when he wants to, when he wants to come on, when he wants to destroy you. And God will send people to you when he wants to bless you. <laughs> Amen. That'll help you write that down. <laughs> Amen? How many of you are taking notes today? How many of you? Well, you know, some of you used to take notes all the time. Some of you used to be disciples. Disciples take notes. Disciples want to know what God's saying and go and study it for themselves. Disciples want to hear what the teacher has to say. But see, we, we get caught up in this, in this thing called ministry. We get caught up in this thing called... Come on, all of us do... We get caught up in this thing called ministry. 
We get caught up in this thing called life. We get caught up in all these things and we fail the, to see the importance or we think we got it all together or we think we know it all or we think we don't need to be taught no more. Or we just don't care. Or maybe it's neither. Maybe we're just tired. Maybe we just need a, a poke. Maybe we just need, you know, maybe we just need the pastor to say, hey, point this out and, and then get back on track. Why? Because some people used to be studious. They used to take notes. And I notice when people stop. And I wonder why. I, want, I notice when some people that, that was disciples, they were following close. They were listening to what God had to say because they valued the pulpit. Come on. They valued this. And I'm not saying, listen, I'm just a vessel. That's all. Okay. I, that's, let me get that to you. All I am is a vessel, a conduit. Okay. I try to hear from God. I'm, I'm called to stand in a place. I hear from and deliver what the Spirit of God, the best I can, that He's saying. Can I mess up? Oh, of course I can. Why? Because the, the Spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. Of course I can mess it up. But if I can submit myself and my tongue uh, to a place where I can say, Holy Spirit, my body's yours. I prepare myself the best way I can. I pray, God, don't let my words come out. Anything that's going to be un, that's not rightly divided in, in your truth and setting it. Pray that God will God will help me and guide me and help me to say the right things and to deliver exactly what He wants to say to His people. And then I can do that and I can prepare myself and study to show myself approved unto God and be the best possible vessel that I can be. Can I still make a mistake? Of course. Of course. That's why studious and study is good. Because see, we used to be studious. We used to study. We used to listen and go and study it for ourselves and say, I want to know that. Not just because the preacher said it, but I want to know it for myself. I believe you. My spirit bears witness to what truth is, but at some point I'm going to have to have my own relationship. I need to know what you're saying. I need to know what God's bringing out. Because some of this stuff you're getting, going to get nuggets. You're going to get things that you need. But you don't need it because you're too holy. Maybe I'm talking to somebody online here. <clears throat> I'm saying sometimes we get to that place and we think and we we these are these are these are things that you start to look. These are called markers to show somebody that is on a backslidden state. Are you hearing? Me? I didn't say you backslid. I said these are markers to show what is wrong. Because we're making disciples. That's what Jesus told us to do. What I've got is I sit with apostles all the time, people that are church planners. I sit with lead pastors all the time. Some of them's got 20 and 30 in their congregation. Some of them's got thousands in their congregation. And I listen to them and I listen to their perspectives. I listen to the way they think. I, I listen to how they're, the, the condition of their congregations. And you know what I hear a lack thereof right now in the body of Christ? is true discipleship. True disciples which are students. That's what a student is. A disciple. I'm a student of His Word. I come with expectation. I come with faith to reach out and pull something out of God's man that I need for my life. Because I'm on the team. Amen? And so those things are markers for our lives. I notice it happened with some of you and I've got to be able to confront it in love and tell you that I love you. Because when you see those things start happening, you wonder. It makes you wonder what's going on. Whose voice are you listening to? Do you know more than me? I mean, I, maybe you do in some areas. But you're not anointed to stand where I'm standing. I'm helping you. Come on, you're helping me, Pastor. I'm talking to mature Christians tonight. I'm not talking to babies out here needing to be saved or, or, or people lost. I'm not talking to them tonight. I'm talking to the... This is Wednesday night. I'm talking to mature Christians tonight. Church. Church people. It's a, it's a heart posture that, that, that you once you once come in humility, you once came to receive. Somewhere you cut it off. You used to take pages of notes. What happened? And I'm not telling you you gotta take pages. I don't take pages. But I found myself doing the same thing, brother. 
when I sat with my pastors, when I sat with preachers, when I sat, I found myself doing the same thing. And you know what was happening? I was growing cold in my heart and didn't even know it. Because now I just, I could set that down. I didn't need to make an effort because I could just sit and I could just listen and I could get it It'd be in my spirit. And then I'd, 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 I'd be able to, I'd go out and be there and I'd have it, right? Okay, I'm going to get off that for a minute. So we're talking about Holy Spirit being our guide. These things are <clears throat> things you make an effort to do that you care about. Amen? Are we students? Are we disciples? So in Matthew chapter 3, in verse number 16, we're going to go and we're going to look at the account of Jesus. Matthew chapter 3. Chapter number or chapter number three, verse number sixteen. And Jesus, when he was baptized, he went straight up out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending on him like a dove, and lighting upon him. But here's where I want to get to: a lower voice came, saying, "This is my beloved Son, whom I'm well pleased." Now, verse number one of chapter four. If you go on down, he says this, and then Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness. To be tempted. Say that. To be tempted. To be tempted. To be tempted. The Spirit of God led Jesus in the wilderness to be tempted. That don't make sense to a natural person. Does not make sense to a natural person. A natural mind, you don't even think that way. Why would the Holy Spirit lead me to be tempted by the devil? I mean, come on. Wouldn't he lead me away from him? But now it says he led him to the wilderness to be tempted of the devil, and Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights. But what happened in the wilderness that when he came, he said, This what? He said, It is written. When the devil came to him, it is written. When the devil came, it is written. I know my covenant with God. Here it is. I know who I am. I know who I, I know who I serve. I know what the Word says. But if you don't study, if you don't read your Word, how do you know what the Word says? You know what we've got. I'm, pre I'm preaching on everybody now. This is why we got. Listen to me. This is why. This is why we've got worship in our churches, and they don't know they're singing unbelief because they don't know it's unbelief because they don't know the Word. They singing hymnals. I never know him. I mean, come on, some of the songs. But they singing hymnals and they singing songs and they ain't even agreeing with scripture. It is. It is. They don't even. Some of them don't even agree with it. But you don't have enough of the word in you. You don't know the word to know what scripture is and truth is. He said Jesus was full of grace and truth. We got people that speak unbelief. I mean, they just. Rattle all kind of stuff, and we all can get that way. But do we have enough word in us and truth in us to know what truth is? Jesus said he's full of grace and truth. That's why we got a mixed up generation today. They don't know what they want to do. And I'm pulling you up, and I'm, I'm also correcting some things and getting you to see some things that are very important. That if you start letting these things slip, your focus gets off. And how long does that happen before? That's with all of us. How long does my lack of prayer life last me? How long does my lack of study time, how long does that last me? If, if you want to stand to prove, I used to pray that. I used to get on my knees. Brother Jason, I'd say, Lord, I want to stand to prove before you. He said, study to show yourself approved. If you study rightly dividing the Word, guess what? You will show yourself approved. Obey what God has said. So the Spirit of the living God, He leads Jesus into the wilderness. And you've got to see this. Here comes the devil to tempt Him, doing what the devil's job is to do. 
But he led him there. But he didn't lead him there until he was filled with the Spirit, until he had the Spirit of God on him. A lot of people think, I get anointed by God. I get the anointing. I'm praying in other tongues. I'm, I, I've got it all together. And then all hell breaks loose in your life. And you're like, what happened? I'll tell you exactly what happened. You got anointed. That's what happened. You got anointed. That's exactly what happened. You got the power now to destroy the devil. You got the power to put him in. You got the power to speak the word. And, and guess what? Now all hell breaks loose. And you don't know what, what's going on. You think, my God, I thought it'd be easy selling. But the Bible says it's clear. The examples are clear. It says that he got anointed. He, you know, the Spirit of God descended on Jesus like a dove and then led him into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. To be tempted. But He was dealing with the Word. Jesus was the Word made flesh. <laughs> he, he was the Word made flesh. Like, like He was full of grace and truth. That's all He had. That's all He was. So, He was full of grace and truth. Right? But if you think about it, before that happened, Jesus was being prepared. He grew in grace. He was a man just like me and you. Right? He was he was still in right relationship with the Father. He was found in the temple at 12 years old. And he was sitting with him. He was teaching, we understand, but he was also a student too. Because it says that he grew in grace, or he grew, not grace, he grew in wisdom and he grew in stature and favor with God and with man. He grew. God literally understood what it was like at that moment to be a man. The difference was he was a man without sin, second Adam, last Adam. He was just like the first, but he was the last. Son of God. That's why he said in 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 in, in the in John chapter three and verse sixteen, he said, For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. Begotten means father. Father. His only fathered Son. He is the only begotten. Whosoever believes in Him will not perish. But have everlasting life. And that's why it says His resurrection was your resurrection. His resurrection was my resurrection. So when, when God raised Him from death to life, the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that dwells within me and you, is the same Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, that lives within me and you, is the same one that raised Jesus from death to life. The same one. Same Holy Ghost. Am I right? Same Holy Spirit raised Jesus of Nazareth from death to life. And He raised you from death to life. Amen? So He was the first born from the dead. Firstborn. First, firstborn from among the dead. He was literally crucified, became sin, who knew no sin, so me and you could become the righteousness of God in Him. He was really crucified. He faced death for every man. The dimension, he, did, he left nothing out. He said it's finished. He left nothing out on the cross. And He went into the heart of the earth, faced death, faced the penalty for death. Three days later, He was resurrected. And He came up out of that grave body and all. Amen. He came up out of that grave. The grave couldn't hold him. Sometimes what looks like defeat in your life is really is really God sealing the victory in the unseen realm. Sometimes it might you might be sitting here like this looking around you and you might think defeat has happened, but let me tell you something, honey. Sometimes the defeat's just like the cross was to the natural eye and to the natural world. They think it's a defeat, but in the heavenly realm, God's saying, No, I'm sealing the victory. I'm already sealing that victory. I'm doing something in the heavenlies that you can't see yet. I'm finna, I'm finna manifest that thing. You ever I'm finna bring it out. See, three days later, he brought out the victory. What looked like the death, what looked like death, he said, death, he said, darkness covered the earth in that day. Guess what? Darkness covered the earth. Jesus went into the heart of the earth. He was resurrected the third day and victory came out of that tomb. Come on somebody. Victory came out of that tomb. He came out resurrected body in all His glorified state. Come on somebody. Hey! Hallelujah! Oh death, He said, where is your sting? Oh grave, where is your victory? Come on! 
So sometimes what the, don't always judge what's going on in the natural. Don't always judge somebody about what's going on in the natural. Come on, don't ever don't 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 always judge that. Don't always don't don't always look with those eyes. Sometimes hell tried to take you out because it knew what you had. Come on. Some, sometimes sometimes that wilderness, in that wilderness experience, the devil tried to kill you, but God said no. The devil tried to take you out, but God said no, that's mine. Amen. So I'm here to remind us today. I'm here to remind us today of the obedience. So Jesus went into the went into the wilderness. And what happened? When he went into the wilderness, he was tempted of the devil. He was tempted of the devil. And every time he said, It is written, it is written, it is written. When you get tempted, do you know what's written? Do you know what's written? Do we know what's written? I want you to go to Acts chapter number 9 verses 1 through 19. And this is what I wanted to get to right here. Remember, we're talking about the Holy Spirit our God, but I'm going to get into some meat of the Word. Again, keep this perspective, church. Body of Christ. Keep this mentality. Body of Christ. Keep this mentality. Body of Christ. Keep this mentality. Jesus is the head of our body. We are His body. Okay, say that. We are His body. Keep this mentality. We are His body. We are His body. We are His body. I didn't get this in the early days and I thought I was just running around everywhere by myself. If I would have moved and I would have been more of a team player, we could have accomplished more. If I would have found my place inside the body knowing that I complement the others, that we're all a joint that's fitly jointed that brings a supply to the body. And when it's all fitly joined together, it becomes the most powerful entity on the earth. Amen? Verse number 9, he says, And Saul... Yet breathing out his threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and desired him letters of Damascus in the synagogues. And if he found any of this way, whether they be men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And he journeyed and came to Damascus, and suddenly there shined around shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he said, Who art thou? Lord, called him Lord. And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the bricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what will you have me to do? The Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city. Now watch this. When he had the encounter with Jesus, watch. This is going to help us now. Now remember, church body, say that. Body. Church body, come on. Church body. Keep this, keep this mentality. Keep this mentality. Church body. 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 Watch this. He had an encounter with Jesus. And Jesus gives, he falls down, trembling and astonished, and he says, Lord, what would you have me to do? What would you have me to do, Lord? And the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what you must do. Arise and go into the city. And Jesus gave him an instruction. Could Jesus, being Lord, could He not have just wrecked him, baptized him in His Spirit, filled him with the Spirit, opened his eyes, gave him the instructions, and told him, you go out and preach everywhere. Could He have not done that? He's God. He's Lord, right? So could He have not done that? But He didn't do it that way, did He? Remember what we were talking about with, with even Jesus having to submit to John's ministry? Even having to come... This is the Messiah. And He had to be baptized by John? But God could have set it up. He could have just walked on the earth and just stomped everybody down that didn't agree. That's not the way God chose to do it. 
God set man in the earth and said, I'm going to give man dominion. Here it is. This is it. He didn't mean for it to happen that way, but he had a plan of redemption because he knew mankind without him was not good enough. It was never going to be good enough. And he was the only one that could come pay the price for you and me. And that's a beautiful thing because that opened it up for whosoever will, let him come and take of the water of life freely. Whosoever will, let him come and be saved. That opened it up for all of us. For all of us. Amen. And so Jesus gives him an instruction and he tells Paul, he says, now I want you, he tells Saul at this time, I want you to go to Damascus. He strikes him blind. Follow along here. And the men which so joined with him, so he told him what he must do. He gave him the instruction. Say that, the instruction. The instruction. And Saul arose from the earth and when his eyes were open, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, neither did he eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. The Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street which you have called straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayed. See, when he followed the instruction, listen, this is what I'm fixing to challenge us in the church because God's taking us somewhere. Say he's taking us somewhere. But it's going to take our part. And now he's challenging us to go further and to sacrifice and to be challenged to more. Why do you think I'm challenging somebody that are no longer taking notes? You better ask yourself these questions. Why is it not important for you no more? Why? something you got to answer for yourself. Because it's something you better shift. To see, we're going somewhere and, and, and right now we're a whole church body that God's leading somewhere by faith. It's not just me out here running around or you. It's us, our families, our kids and everybody that's being connected. And so now it's a whole church entity that's going together. Are you feeling? Are you hearing? I'm getting you to see something here. This is what God reminded me of because I've been in this place before, but I was in this place as an evangelist, never as a where I'm standing now, leading a whole church. He didn't give Paul the second instruction or assignment until he followed the first. He said, Go to Damascus and wait. And as the Word came, the Word of the Lord came. When I had the evangelist come up two days ago, he came with the Word of the Lord, man. I knew he would. I prayed. We said, you know, come with the Word of the Lord because it's going to help propel where we're going. It's, going to, it's not going to be out left field somewhere. It's going to be in the direction of where we're headed. God will confirm things. But He makes us also trust and walk by faith. He makes us also press. He, Jesus went into the wilderness and had to fast 40 days to be tempted of the devil? He went to the cross? You think we're not going to have to go through some things? You think we're going to float on cloud nine all the time? That's not the gospel. If you're going to press in and go somewhere with God, we're going to be a church entity that God's going to pour out His Spirit in these last days, and we're going to be prepared for that harvest that God's going to release to us, well, guess what? There's going to be some sacrifice have to be made. There's going to be some people that says, I'm going to have to get in. I'm, I'm going to be a loyal. Amen. I'm going to be loyal. I'm going to be in it to win it. I'm going to be all in and not half in or my toes in. And he said, follow the instruction. Go to Damascus. Now watch this, what he did. He, he made him humble himself too. He said, you go and, and go to Damascus and you wait there and I'm going to send somebody to you. Now this is Paul that wrote most of the New Testament, church. God used him to bring the revelation that we get today that we preach to you. We just preach what he's brought. Now I know we grow in that revelation, but we're just preaching what... So he used Paul to write this, yet he told him, you go to Damascus and I'm going to send somebody to you. You're going to have to humble yourself to another brother 
that, that guess what? That He's anointed to help you. This is Paul. This is Saul. And then what's this? Follow. This is good stuff. Is this good? And what's this? And Saul rose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he led, they led him by the hand to Damascus. In verse number 9, he was there three days without sight, neither did he eat and drink. Sometimes in that faith walk, look here, sometimes you're in that faith walk and God's given you the instruction and He'll shine a light sometimes for us. He'll, he'll give a little bit of a light and you'll have the direction. And then all of a sudden you're walking and you're walking by faith for the instruction that He's given. And, and you're blind at that moment. It's not that you don't have vision and you know, but what I'm saying is it's like it's just like Him going to the road to Damascus. Now I know the instruction was this, so here it goes. Okay, I might have to have a little help. Now we're going down to the, follow the instruction that Jesus told me to do. And I go down to Damascus and I wait. What am I waiting for? I'm waiting for the person that He's sending to come to unlock something in me that I need for the next level, to the next place. Because I can't get step two until I do step one. And until we follow the instruction, like He said. And God will give you instructions that do not make sense. It does not make sense to go down there blind to Damascus and sit there and wait. And sit in there and not eat or drink. That don't make sense to a natural person. But how many of you know Noah, when he stood out there preaching for 120, that didn't make sense either. They out there building an ark and it had never even rained. And he's telling the people, you better repent. That rain's coming and you all going to drown. They didn't listen. They're like, who's that dumb preacher? They out there building an ark. Look at these people. Here, take a sip. Take a drink. Who's that idiot? That's the way we look at sometimes as preachers right now. It don't matter that when it all falls, they're going to say, my God, I wish I'd listened. I wish I'd listened to that tattooed up preacher when he said that. He sounded dumb at the time, but that's okay. I wish I'd listened. And he goes to Damascus. Watch this. In verse number 10, there was a certain disciple named or at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision. Here's a vision right here. In a vision. Ananias, he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. The Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire of the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayed. So when he was following the instruction, he didn't go down there and do nothing. He went down there and prayed. When he was following the instruction that Jesus gave him that said he was down there praying, not only was he praying, but he was fasting. See, that showed that he was serious. He was getting out of his flesh. He was staying into his spirit connected with God because he was born again at that moment. I mean, you can't tell me he wasn't. He didn't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but he was, he was born again. He had met Jesus. He believed in his heart and confessed he was Lord right there on the road to Damascus. He said, if you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, you'll be saved. He was regenerated. He was a born again Christian right then. He just didn't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit yet. He just wasn't in do with power from on high yet. And Jesus gave him an instruction. Said, "You go down there and you wait, and you pray." Well, he didn't. You know, I don't know if he told him that, but he went down there and he prayed and he fasted. He prayed and he fasted, and then Jesus, and then, and then Jesus spoke to Ananias in a vision and said, "I want you to go down there and I want you to put your hand on him that he might receive his sight." Now we believe in the laying on of hands. We know that ain't the only avenue that God can work. He can work through many channels. He can work through channels healing you right there where you're at if you can take a hold of your faith. He can, he can, he can, he can use somebody. But this sense, he was, he, he, he was following or he was given an instruction so there was an instruction made and the obedience to the instruction brought the miracle. But it took two, didn't it? It took him to do it, get ready, pray, fast, and then it took somebody else that listened to him in a vision to go and do exactly what he said. Now we're getting into some meat. Now we're getting into some mature stuff here. And then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard 
by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints of Jerusalem. Now you don't think you don't think Ananias was still battling some things? You know, sometimes we look at these people in the Bible and we think, oh, they was just so they was just so gung ho and everything. They didn't battle no fear. They didn't battle no no questioning. They didn't battle. Well, right here it says it. He says, Lord, what if this guy was killing Christians? You want me to go to him? He was even questioning. He was even having a moment of moment of uncertainty. He it shows it. He was having a moment of not doubting the Lord, but like, man, are you sure this is you? I mean, come on now. You really want us? We did, this song, don't, didn't he kill Don Stephen? Did he do all this? You want me to go to him? So when they was walking around all these big giants, they just know how to pray. They knew how to fast. They knew how to stay in tune with God. And when God would give them an instruction, they were still questioning, but he still ended up obeying the instruction. But he still questioned, Lord, are you sure this song of Tarsus? I feel the Holy Ghost in here. And I answered, Lord, I have many, I've heard of many of this man, how much evil he has done to the saints of Jerusalem. And here he has authority over the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. He said, Man, I've heard all this stuff's going on with him, man. You can imagine Ananias after he heard from the Lord. Right here it shows that he's probably in fear. He's like, My God, don't, don't you know, Lord, that, uh, that, 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 man, he's got authority to do this and he's got authority to do that. Man, he, are you sure? But Lord, but the Lord said to him, Go that way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name from the Gentiles and kings and to the children of Israel. And I will show you how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. So, and Ananias went his way and entered into his house and put his hands on him. Brother Saul, Lord, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way, as thou camest, hath sent me that thou might receive thy sons and be filled with the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Brother Saul. That's what he called him, didn't he? Thank you for that. Look here. Putting his hands on him, Brother Saul. That showed me that he was already born again, wasn't he? He was already born of the Spirit. But he needed that baptism, didn't he? He needed that baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's what we call that. He needed the, the, the infilling, what he was talking about last night, of the Holy Ghost. Right here it is laid out for you in simple, plain English. Brother Saul, receive your sight. Be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately the scales fell from his eyes and he received his sight forthwith and arose. And he was baptized. And when he had received me, he was strengthened. And saw certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. So we see here an instruction that's been given. We're at a pivotal moment. Not pivotal. We're at a, we're at a moment right now where the pressings... Amen. You get to those places where you question. You get to those places where your mind's fighting battles that you never thought it would face. You get to the point where your body is doing things probably that it never has done. I don't know. I'm saying maybe you're not. Maybe you're not facing anything. Maybe you just supernaturally just got, you know, maybe you are. I pray that you are. But maybe you're facing some things you never thought. Maybe you're facing things about yourself that you never thought you'd face. I'm seeing things about y'all I never thought I'd see because I don't see y'all all the time. But now I see you every day. See, when you're at the house with somebody, you see everything. You see the flesh. You see all kinds of stuff. You see when they ain't so pretty, when their teeth ain't brushed, don't you? The socks ain't put on right. Right? Hair ain't fixed. Makeup ain't on. You know, we at church, we just get to see the pretty you. We get, you, get to see the, you get to see the dressed up me. You know what I'm saying? But at home, they get to see it all. So when you're with people every day, you get to see some things you might not have seen about your brother and sister. You get to see them reacting in ways you had not seen them react yet. You get to see them having their, their pity party, their, fit, their fits. Having their day, throwing their rattlers. Throwing their, throwing their pacifier. Getting mad. 
But the huggy's on. <laughs> the elastic breaks on. They had to get those overnight sleepers. It's just too hard, Lord. Because we're pushing to the point. But God said we don't get to step two until we do step one. That's what He told them. It don't make sense to obey God sometimes. It, don't, it makes sense to obey Him, but it don't make sense sometimes with the instructions that He gives us. If you try to work it all out in your mind, but you got to do it by faith, you look crazy. I remember hearing a testimony, and this comes to me. I can tell you something of my own. But I remember this guy saying, the Lord, he was an evangelist, and the Lord spoke to him and said, I want you to go outside of this, this uh, biker rally and stand there and hold your Bible up. It's 1% biker rally. You know, there's hell's angels or somebody. He said, man, it did not make sense to me. I go out here and hold up a Bible outside of the biker rally, you know. But I'm going to obey God. And he said, I went out there, man, and he said, man, I... I tell you, I was going through all kinds of battles in my mind. He said, I felt foolish sometimes, you know. I stand out, he said, it was raining. And the Spirit of God said, no, you stand out there and hold that Bible high. He said, man, I finally obeyed. I put me a poncho on. I got out there and I stood there like this with the Bible. And all these bikers were coming into this place to commit their ungodly acts and all that stuff that was going on. Doing their partying and stuff. And here... Here he is, he said, standing there like this. He said, they're honking at him, cussing him, and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> he's standing there with his Bible. He tell you, preach, he said, he's standing there and holds his Bible up. I don't know how it all went. I think later on, maybe one of them had, had been coming down through there. And it, it, it ministered to him to a point where he changed his life and he got saved that day because he seen a man standing out there and God was already dealing with him. and and could have been that he had been praying and said, Lord, just send me a sign to show me something. You know, I know we don't seek for signs. The Bible's clear about that, but you know what? Maybe he said, Lord, just give me confirmation. You don't know what God was dealing with somebody about. Here's this, here's this crazy guy here with a Bible outside this party that you fix to go and enjoy life in. Enjoy your, your stay. And here he is with a Bible standing out here. And you're like, uh oh, here's your sign, brother. Slapped him right in the mouth with the sign. And he's like, okay. I'm going to get saved. I'm not going down this road no more. I see you guys. I'm out of here. <laughs> I am not going no further with you. You know? So those things don't make sense sometimes if you try to rationalize it all out. But when the instructions have been given and we follow the instructions. And I remember having this happen to me before I started this church. The same thing. God gave me the same thing that He's given us as a whole body. And He gave me an instruction that didn't make sense. And a lot of people didn't agree with me. And a lot of people didn't like me after that. There was a few. But I followed the instruction. He said, you ain't getting step two to you. do step one. I did step, I did step one. I went down there and I was walking by faith. I felt like a... a the blind Barnabas, you know what I'm saying? I'm down there, I'm just like, I know I'm, I'm following the instruction, but I was like, it was almost not that I couldn't see, but it was like I had no other instruction but the instruction that I had, and I'm standing there and I'm just putting my hand to stuff and working and working and working and doing everything I could at the place that I was at. And, and I remember coming in a few months later and going through all kinds of stuff and tests and trials and all that, and I walked in to the place one day and walked into the church and as soon as I walked in, the Holy Spirit dropped it in me and He said, you passed the test. I said, well, that's a good thing. It's got to be. <laughs> wow. And that unlocked step two. That unlocked where we're at today. Everybody's not called to do what I'm doing. Plant churches. But it was a process that led me to plant this church. There was a lot of confirmation along the way. The same thing's happening now, except I'm leading the church. And now we're going as a body and as a unit. It's not a one-man show. It's us together. It don't make sense to put a tent out there for 30 days. It don't make, they don't make natural. I mean, nobody does 30-day meetings hardly, do they? 
Maybe they do somewhere. I don't care about them. Do you? Maybe in a foreign country. There you go. Does anybody hear about 30 days straight? Doesn't make sense nowadays. But that's why we're in the condition we're in in the United States, and that's why we're in the condition we're in in the church world. Is because we've got so complacent in the microwave society, and everything's got to be right now, 15 seconds in, and it's done, and I'm out, and I'm going all about it. And that's the way we've trained ourselves, and that's why we're in the condition that we're in. And that's why when the corona and all that stuff, the demon come up, all that stuff came against the church, most of the church just bowed right down to it because it wasn't prepared for it. Doesn't mean they wasn't the body of Christ, they just wasn't prepared. So you're going to have to shift out of some comfort, shift out of what you think, shift your whole mindset, let God retrain you, renew your mind to the Word of God and truth, challenge yourself so we can go to where God's taking us. Amen? So second step only comes after first. The first step is that blind faith or that stepping out on the instruction and then God confirming with His miracles and confirming with, with, with His hand as we're going in the right direction. But sometimes you feel like, you know, you feel like Paul did as you're being led. This is the way some of you probably feel right now. Come here for a second. This is the way some of you probably feel during this process. Be honest with me. Here's, here's, here's the eyes. Boom. Here's, here's, here's Saul right here. Now, I want you to stick your hand out, okay? Now, just close your eyes. I'll walk you straight, okay? And then here, they're leading. They're leading. You know what I'm talking about? So, it's, sometimes that's what I'm going to hold Turn, 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 turn. Turn, straight, 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 straight. Straight, 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 straight. Straight, what's this, what's this, what's this? Straight, 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 straight. See, she knows it's there. She's like, something's coming up. She knew it was there. Go ahead, thank you. Yeah. She had to keep her hands up. She knew, though, she had a perception of, uh-oh, there's a pole there. See, I could have kept walking her straight into it. And boom. But I see it. And she's a student, she said. So she would have walked right into it because she's a good student. Right? Good. I'm a good student, she said. Good students follow the instructions of their teacher. Yeah. That's what discipleship is. He said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. And actually said in the name of Jesus Christ, I'm not arguing. So, instruction step one. But when he was down there at the place that God had told him to go, when they were there, he did the thing that Jesus did. He fasted and he prayed. I feel the Lord saying this right here, that this right now is a time that we need to enter into fast. Corporately. You feel that? Right now is a time we need to enter into fast and we need to enter into more prayer. And I'm going to commit, no matter what it takes of me, I'm going to do it. No matter what it takes. So we need to commit corporately today. I'm not going to go checking you up and all that. This is something you got to work out with your heart. But if you're in this room, and those of you that watch online, those of you that are maybe part of this, what God's doing, or you're in the church right now with the children, you're watching later. But we're going to enter into a fast. Whatever that fast looks like for you. I'm not going to tell you to go without food for three days, but I'm saying whatever that fast looks like for you. But a fast is giving up something that you want, that you desire, giving up something that you, that you, you know, that could be coffee, that could be food, that could be sugar, that could be whatever God tells you, whatever the Holy Spirit leads you to do. You get with Him and ask Him. 
Whatever you feel led to do, that's what you fast. Is it social media? Is it TV? What is it? And I tell you this, if it's something that got your attention, be a good thing to fast. Be a good thing to fast, wouldn't it? So if y'all don't hear nothing from me on the phone, I might fast my phone. I don't know how that's going to work. That's how we accomplish everything. You know what? What did we do before phones? Does anybody remember? She said we drove. We wrote letters. We did. We wrote letters, didn't we? Man, that was cool. I actually remembered numbers in them days. I actually, I knew everybody's number by heart. I probably had a list of like 50 numbers downloaded in me. I knew their numbers. Well, this is Bob's number, not, you know, four, you know 426 back in them days. Four two or eight six five four two six 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 three five. You know, my old number was eight six five four two six seven four one five. And I can't tell you my wife's number. It says wife. It's wife. Half of us don't even know our own number because we're so used to having the the contact and just pulling it up and being able to. And there ain't nothing wrong with that because it helps us to accomplish things. And guess what? You can't remember everything. It helps you remember what's important and not have all this storage going on and all this other stuff. So write that down. I want to encourage you. Write that down. I encourage you. Fast. Fast. Let's say for the rest of this week. How about that? Until Sunday. Well, what is today? Wednesday? Let's go till next Wednesday. And that's up to you what you fast. Can you tell me this? Who, who's going to fast with me? I want to know. I want to, I want to see your hands. If you're not, just, just tell me no. I'm not mad at you. Are you going to fast? Yeah. Yeah. He ain't going to fast. But this is really what I'm looking at right here. And we're going to pray. How many is going to commit to, to more of a prayer life? How many says I'm going to commit to pray more? I'm talking about shut your phone off, take the battery out or something, and get in prayer. If you pray in the Holy Ghost, pray in the Holy Ghost for an hour. Pray in the Holy Ghost, pray in the Spirit for an hour. And then after, after you pray in the Spirit for an hour, pray in the natural for an hour. We're getting breakthrough, church. We're going, we're going to the next place. we get getting the next assignment. We're getting the next start. Come on. And just like Paul, we're, we're no different. We're a New Testament church. So if we get in there and really look at the meat of the Word, I mean, you know what? During that, during that time he was fasting and praying, God spoke to somebody else in a vision and then sent him to Paul. So that showed me that, that Jesus demanded. What did he demand? Humility. Submission. It takes humility for the man that was just killing Christians to get to meet the Lord, follow the instruction, and wait on another man to come to him and lay hands on him so he could receive a miracle. That's why I have no problem with another preacher that I trust. I have no problem being the first one up letting him lay hands on me. I have no problem at all. If I know him, I trust him, even if I bear witness, I have no problem. I have no problem laying on an altar. I don't think, well, what are they going to think? I sin? We've all sinned and fell short of the glory of God. Everybody sinned and fell short of the glory of God. What do you mean? I have no problem with getting on an altar. Just to pray. I have no problem with it. I have no problem with letting somebody lay hands on me. I model that. I went to, went to California and got with the, 
Apostle Dwayne and them, and with the fellowship and, 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 and Pastor Pastor Tommy and them. And I walked up afterwards. There was almost 4,000 people in this meeting. 3,500 people, 3,600 people in this meeting. And after everybody kind of cleared out, I just walked up there. And we were all talking, standing there. And we were standing around. And I said, well, I'm not coming this far without getting y'all to lay hands on me and pray for me. Y'all don't have to lay hands on me, man. I'm the hungriest man for Jesus that you ever met in your entire life. And I believe I still am. I'm the hungriest man for Jesus you've ever met in your life. If you want to challenge me, let's race. Not in competition. Let's see who's hungry. <laughs> Us men, we're competitive. You know what? Let's see who's the hungriest. Let's see who's the hungriest man for Jesus. Let's see who's the prayer warrior. I'm serious. Let's see who pray the hardest. Let's see who, let's see who pass the hardest. But I remember standing there and, and we were standing there and I grabbed his hand. He probably looked at me like, he's like, I did kind of grab it hard, but I was in such a state. And I grabbed his hand. I went right there, put it on my chest. I said, pray for me. Put your hands on me. I just held my hands up. They stood around and they began to prophesy. They began to pray. And when I got down, I walked out. And I'm ready to go back to the motel, get up at 6 in the morning, take a flight. 4 in the morning, take a flight back to the United States. I mean, back to Tennessee from California. I said, well, if I'm ever called to another country, I hope it's California. But I had fun. I had fun. I obeyed God. That's what matters. Because if it had been just what I wanted to do, I'd probably go on playing that. I mean, I wanted to go, but I, I didn't want to do that bad. But God said, go. Now I want to do bad. <laughs> now I want to go. <laughs> the Lord said, go. Right? Thank God for my wife. And you say, well, what? You start, she started setting it up for me, didn't she? She started getting on it, didn't she? Well, I hope you guys have taken something from this. And I hope you realize that if Jesus went through it, Paul went through it, we're no different. You know? And when we get when we, when we start entering into this place, I mean, if we want to be mature Christians, then we just we allow God to take us into deeper realms of glory, deeper places in His Spirit, deeper revelations of His Word. Well, this is Word. I'm talking about His Word. I'm not talking about weirdness and all that. I'm talking about these were mature things that was happening. I mean, He was a baby Christian, but at the same time, He was still following a pretty mature instruction. You told Christians that today. If you prayed for them and come up here and, and, and something happened, you told them, okay, now I want you to go back to your home. I want you to lock yourself in your bedroom and don't eat and don't drink for three days and then somebody's going to knock on your door in three days. And when they when they knock on the door, their name's going to be Bob and he's going to come in and lay hands on you and then you're going to get something from God. They'll be like, man, I'm out of here. I'm going to the church down the street. Because you're all crazy. Tell me to go lock myself in a bedroom until Bob comes and lays his hands on me and, 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 and helps me. You're all crazy. You know, think about that. How many people's in tune with God? How many people's, how many of us are really in tune with the Holy Spirit? So I want to close with the people online right now. We love you guys. Appreciate you. I pray that this is challenging you and helps you. It's just this teaching that God gave me today. I've had it before, but something He said to remind us of where we're at. And uh, we're going to close with that in Jesus' name. Amen.